We're going to learn that there are some features about shame that we're familiar with, but it might be helpful for us to be a little more explicit about. The first feature has to do with this notion of judgment. As we like to say, judge not lest ye be judged. What are we referring to? What we mean is that shame doesn't necessarily have a definition as much as it is something I will describe. I'll offer this description with some features that begin with this notion of judgment. That and other features will be helpful for us to pay attention to because it gets us a better sense of what shame is all about. Speaking of judgment, we all know what it's like for us to condemn others when I'm critical, when I'm contemptuous even, when I'm condemning of others in the way they look and the way they think and the way they feel, whether it's politics or religion or no matter what or what it is. It could even be within our own families. And this is essentially an overflow from our own self-condemnation that precedes it. We carry so much shame within us that we then decide that we're going to share the wealth with others around us. We feel self-contemptuous, and it is out of our own self-contempt, it is out of our own shame that we share that then, that we discharge that by giving it to other people. That's one of the main features of shame, our sense and tendency toward condemnation. Will's story as an employer tells us something about this. He was someone who was trying to help his employees do as well as they could, and one of the methods that he employed was pointing out things about them that they could always be doing better at, largely without also highlighting what they were doing well. This created within his employees a sense that all Will was able to see was what they were doing wrong. Now, if you were to ask Will, he would have said to you, gosh, I'm just trying to help them do the best job that they can. This kind of technique of pointing out flaws with a particular spirit of condemnation has been something that we do with our parenting, with our coaching, disciplinary tactics, all over. But we find, sooner or later, that shame in this way, this feature of condemnation, ultimately is not sustainable as a means of changing behavior and moving it in the direction that we want it to go. One of the other features about shame is our tendency to play hide and seek. This feature of shame has us wanting to hide in our internal and external behaviors. One of the things that we'll note about later in another session is the general physiological way in which shame works. You might have seen a dog look ashamed before, and when a dog is ashamed, a dog puts its head down, puts its eyes down, its tail between its legs. It turns away from others. This is what we tend to do with shame. We hide from one another. We hide from ourselves. Stephen was a trial lawyer who was needing to think right in everything that he did. And in his effectiveness at thinking right and being a successful trial lawyer, he left behind his family and his marriage because he needed to be so successful. Now, if you were to think of this as having anything to do with shame, one would think, what would that have to do with it? But for Stephen, his shame was hiding in plain sight. How so? Here was a guy who had grown up at a dinner table in which everything, including religious faith experience, was critiqued at the kitchen table. Are you thinking correctly? And it wasn't just the question of, am I correct? Am I thinking wisely? It was a question, if I'm not right, then I'm wrong. And the feeling that is attached to that is the sense that if I'm wrong, there's something wrong with me. Gloria was someone else who had this sense of shame hiding and having her hiding then as a result. Gloria got married to a man who loved her dearly, but it wasn't until they'd been married for many years that she finally was able to tell him about her abortion that she'd had before they'd even met each other. This was so shaming to her that she was unable, therefore, to let him tell anyone else or let them as a couple share it before she had become depressed to the point where she was in my office. Shame in this way has us hiding from ourselves and from each other. And in that sense, when we hide this long, sooner or later, symptoms will start to show up. Another feature of shame, beside its tendency toward creating in us a spirit of condemnation and our tendency to hide, is that it is self-perpetuating. 
Nancy and Mark had been married for some time when it was discovered that Nancy had an eating behavior that was untenable for her to talk about. She wouldn't let Mark talk about the problem, but every time Mark wanted to talk about it, even wanted to go for marriage counseling about it, she wouldn't let him. In fact, the very noting of the thing that was so shaming to her reinforced her felt sense of shame, and as a result, only tightened its grip. Another feature of shame that we like to talk about is how it tends to divide and conquer. It disintegrates not just individuals, but systems, including Helen's family. Helen was the middle of five children. She was someone who created no problems in her family and got used to doing that really quite well. This meant that in addition to creating no trouble, she also wasn't noticed very much. Not noticed like her older brother in particular was with his children. Helen's parents were quick to laud her brother's children, to talk about them endlessly, to the point where Helen and her family, her husband and her children themselves, were often neglected. During one holiday vacation, when Helen attempted to highlight something that her daughter was doing, her mother moved on quickly and just ignored her. In that instance, Helen exploded with anger. It ended with a plate full of food flying across the room and a wine glass shattering because what was happening to her wasn't just about what was happening to her. It was shame that had been occupying the entire system of her family. 